Thank you, Lee. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on academic advising for high achieving students, strategies that foster resilience. My name is Melissa Johnson and I'm the Associate Director of the University of Florida Honors Program, as well as Chair of the Commission for Advising High Achieving Students with NACADA. I'm excited to serve as moderator for today's webinar. For those of us who work closely with high achieving students, issues of resilience have been at the forefront of our concerns in advising. We often hear from students, should I drop a class because I'm not getting an A? I'm struggling in chemistry, so should I give up my dreams of becoming a doctor? I'm not as good as my roommate in X, Y, or Z field, so how did I even get into this program? Often high achievers are faced with these questions and doubts for the first time ever in their lives, and they don't know how to respond. At the 2014 Nakata Annual Conference in Minneapolis, I had the opportunity to attend a Best of Region presentation on resiliency. It was exactly what I needed. Afterwards, I approached the presenters about adapting their talk for a webinar, and here we are now. Without further delay, I am honored to introduce our webinar presenters, Carrie and Nova. Thanks so much, Melissa, for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to go first. Uh, my name is Carrie Thomas. I'm an academic advisor at Oregon State University. When Nova and I first uh, began working together and developing this idea for a presentation, I advised with the College of Liberal Arts, and now I advise with international degree majors. Uh, we really got this idea because Nova and I worked a lot um, doing an academic intervention program with students who were in academic jeopardy during their first year at Oregon State University. So that's where a lot of the impetus for this uh, for this information and, and, and this curriculum really came about. So we'll talk about that throughout the presentation as well as uh, different curriculum that we've used teaching in classrooms and different advising sessions. And I'll uh, hand it over to Nova here to introduce herself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nova Schaus Ferguson. So wonderful to be here with you all. Um, as Carrie mentioned, we, we previously collaborated quite a bit on a number of campus wide projects at Oregon State University. Uh, my specific role was within the College of Engineering. So worked very closely with STEM students, many of which who entered as very high achievers from high school and were encountering academic difficulty for the very first time as first year college students. Um, I also taught a number of first year transition courses, um, non-technical courses in the College of Engineering and also um, coordinated our academic resource center that included academic coaching, tutoring, study tables, um, and all of those sorts of support mechanisms. So wonderful to be here with you all. All right, everyone. Uh, so this is the point where we give sort of our outline of the presentation, what we're going to review today. It's also the time where I want to prompt you, if you have not already downloaded the handout that we uploaded to the website, that's something that if you have access to, I would recommend that you download to view throughout the presentation. Or if you don't have the ability to do that, make sure that you download it after the presentation. We have a huge number of resources as well as links and references for all of our research, and then a few different pieces of application. Um, as well, if there's anything that really piques your interest, we do have quite a bit more, um, especially around the realm of curriculum, that we can send to you. So please uh, send myself or Nova an email and, and we can get you connected in with further resources. Uh, so definitely stay tuned. But that was when, when we decided to pull this together as a presentation, we wanted to make sure to have something that you could really take and implement right away. And the handout really helps bridge that gap. So definitely make sure to reference that. All right. Uh, so when Nova and I started out doing this first presentation, uh, we did this early on in March in 2014 at our regional conference uh, in Region 8. And we actually started out with a slide that said, failed with a big red stamp on it. And um, while people really enjoyed our presentation, which we're really grateful for, we got some feedback about that slide feeling very harsh, very uncomfortable, that the language failed just seemed too punitive and mean. Uh, so after that point, as Nova and I gave the presentation more times, we changed to this image, warning, challenges ahead. And, and isn't that what we really do oftentimes as advisors? We sort of advisor the situation. Oh, it's not that bad, you know. Lots of students get, uh, you know, an F on their first midterm. Lots of students get a B for the first time ever when they come to college. Lots of students don't get into pro school. We sort of 
take away the pain of the feel and we try to say, let's put it in this more manageable language, right? And while that is something that can be helpful for students, what Nova and I really found as we've given this presentation many times and really saw, sat with the concept of failure is that even though we can advise her away the language we can provide a plan or a fix to the situation when a student's going through something they feel that emotion so deeply they're sitting in the first f that they've ever gotten in college and right here they're thinking i'm not smart how did I get into this school? People are gonna find me out. What does this mean? It's, it's a huge crisis. And, and when we diminish that emotion, we're not necessarily helping students be more resilient. We're sort of glossing over the depth of that feeling. And what we really wanna emphasize during this presentation is that resiliency is not diminishing your failures. Rather, resiliency is learning how to live through your failures, to experience them fully, and to take what you've learned during that failure and turn it into something else. Turn it into a way to move forward. Uh, so we're definitely going to be making sure to emphasize that throughout the presentation, because no matter what, when we hear students present something that feels to them very large, it may not seem as large to us, or it may seem like something students experience all the time, but it's important for us as their advisor to honor that experience that they're going through. So when Carrie and I started talking through how would we conceptualize this idea of resiliency and what type of research and literature do we wanna pull from, um, we thought, well, we could just focus on a couple areas or we could provide advisors with a lot of potential options to dig into. So what we're gonna go through today are six areas of research. Some are very well established, others are more on the emerging side. And the goal is not that you as an advisor will connect to every single one or find direct application in every single one. And if that happens, that's great. Um, but if you're kind of hearing something, you're thinking, gosh, I just don't know how I would connect that particular idea or intervention to my student population, that's okay. If you just leave with a couple good nuggets or ideas that you can implement, that's wonderful. And the goal of all this, as Carrie mentioned, was to give you things that you can implement today. You can go back to your office after this webinar and put these things in practice. There's no grant money that's required for this. There's no huge, um, complete uh, overhaul of programmatic structures. We're going to present a lot of really simple but impactful approaches. Um, and the other thing we want to mention is that so often as advisors, we kind of secretly do theory to our students. You know, we all take these classes on student development theory and we kind of hear a buzzword from a student and think, oh, they said this, therefore, I'm going to secretly covertly respond with this approach. And while that might be helpful and appropriate at times, a lot of this research is really powerful when students understand it. So we want to be really clear that this is not stuff that we need to secretly do to students, but to involve them actively in this research. So we're going to share a number of examples wherein we've really presented very clearly to students what the research is showing and the impact that had in their experiences and our work as advisors. So again, if you haven't had an opportunity to print off that handout, um, please do, or certainly afterward. And again, we're more than happy to kind of talk through ideas, options, um, talk a little bit more about where we received some of these resources and where we found some of this information. Uh, and this is by no means an exhaustive list of all the resources out there on this topic. We simply compiled some of the ones that we've used most consistently in our own practice that we've kind of test run and have some um, some real life stories to share and we've got a nice spectrum some that are a little bit more academic in nature that would certainly be a nice maybe book club of sorts with advisors or other professionals and others that are very accessible to students themselves so we've got a nice spectrum of resources to provide you with today all right thanks nova um so we're gonna go ahead and get it started in our research wheel uh, so we're starting at the top with one of nova and i's favorites so if if you all haven't had a chance to view any of Brene brown's ted talks um, or to read any of her articles i highly recommend that she would be a first stop on your list uh, a main reason for that and the main reason we feature her first is that she really has a way of making complex complicated emotions 
easy to understand and, and really resonant. Um, and, and there's going to be a video that we're going to show later that I think will really capture her presentation style well. Her background is in social work, um, so she, she really does a lot of work in understanding how people and relationships sort of come together and process these different emotions and experiences throughout life. Now, the things that I really wanted to bring up when I'm talking about how Brene Brown shares some key insights around resiliency are that there are a couple of different things that she talks about. Now, the first thing, and I want you to keep in mind that student that came in, especially that high achiever that experienced this first roadblock, and they're really reeling from that experience. Now, the first thing that she says is key in developing resiliency is to cultivate hope. Because oftentimes when students come into our offices and they're experiencing something they've never experienced in their lives, they're in this valley, right? And they don't see any way out. They don't see any ability to sort of find that light again or, or find that confidence that they had previously. And they're feeling extremely deflated. So what you can do is try to show them patterns or help them see how, how persistence and how hard work may be able to get them back into that frame of reference or that identity that they hold so, hold so dearly. The other thing that she talks about, and this is one of my favorite things, it is super hard to be a human being, right? To go through the world, to interact with people, conversations all day long, wearing many different hats from partner to parent, to professional, to advisor, to friend, to mentor, to teacher. And in all of these different arenas, we constantly have these voices in our head saying, oh God, Carrie, why did you say it like that? Or, you know, I can't believe that, you know, you didn't make breakfast for your daughter. Or, you know, I can't believe that, you know, when you went to class today, you did this presentation and the students just, it fell flat. And, you know, so, so we often have these voices of criticism that go through our brains. And if we speak those things, out loud, oftentimes our peers are like, oh, what are you talking about? You did great. You look fine. Catch yourself a break, right? We do that to our peers often, but we don't often say that to ourselves, right? So it's really important to be critically aware of that voice, that negative self-talk, that negative criticism that can happen, and to be able to give it a reality check and say, you know, okay, I know that I'm feeling really crummy about what just happened here. But am I maybe taking that level of self-persecution a bit too far, right? So, so sometimes this is something that you can help your students understand through. Again, not diminishing the feeling, but, but allowing students to understand when they need to be honest with themselves about a situation and when they're taking it too far and making the situation much bigger than it is. The other thing, feel your full feelings. And this comes back to that slide about really putting failure back in the center of the experience, right? Because if students come in and they're experiencing something that really happened that is to them very life altering, identity threatening, um, for us to try to make it seem like it's something that everyone experiences and that it's okay and you're just gonna bounce back and that's all right, is not really allowing that individual to feel their full feelings. And if you don't feel the way that failure feels, you'll never learn to develop those skills to move through it. And that's the whole point of this talk, is to helping individuals, not just our students, even though we're using that language a lot today, but helping everyone feel the emotion, process what's happening, give yourself a break, right? Don't make it bigger than it is, but then also try to recognize how through, through persistence and through hard work, you will be able to get into a good situation again. And remember, three things from Brene Brown, right? Have the courage to embrace your imperfection. Be compassionate to yourself and to others. And find authentic connections, right? Because at the end of this, in order to develop resiliency when you're really struggling, it's hard to do by yourself and it's hard to do with people who don't authentically connect with you. And authentic connection is going to be a key throughout, um, throughout our presentation today. 
So I want to chat a little bit about uh, protective factors. Now, this is a concept by another uh, social worker, Nan Henderson. That's what her background is in. Now, the majority of her research is uh, based in K through 12 education. Um, but again, working with college students, it's a very similar, um, similar vein, similar developmental trends, especially towards the later scale of that. And um, there's a lot of really good information that we can take from this. Now, the best thing that I love about Nan Henderson is that she really calls calls into question the environment surrounding the person, right? Because if you are an extremely resilient person, but you're in a super challenging environment, devoid of support or protective factors, you're going to struggle exponentially more than you would if you were in an environment that had the presence of some protective factors. And on the converse, if you're not a resilient person, but you have a lot of protective factors, you might be able to persist through a situation more successfully. The other thing I want to call um, to your attention is that the next researcher we're going to talk about is Martin Seligman. And, and this, uh, Nan Henderson's work has often been called sort of the completing piece to his work around Flourish. Um, so what Nan Henderson really talks about and that she emphasizes is that there are these different aspects of the environment that are very key in order for a person to be able to push through through failure in order to be able to be resilient. Now what I like to hone in on is the advisor one, right? Provide caring and support. Now this is over and over cited by Nan that is the most impactful area of protective factors. And now I know we can all imagine and remember that student that has come in and, you know, for whatever reason, they haven't made connections on campus. They're not particularly close or able to openly talk with their parents about their experience. They don't really have a person that they feel like is sort of, you know, in their corner. And they're coming into your office and they're telling you really personal stuff. They may be one of your frequent flyers, right? They're always sort of coming in and saying, this is going on, what do I do? How, how should I think about this? How do I feel? Now, what you wanna think about when you start recognizing what these relationships are is oftentimes it's students who have made you the person in their corner, right? For some reason or another, they're connecting with you. They recognize that you value them. You're having an authentic relationship with them. And the advice that you're giving them may be exponentially more important than you realize because you might be their only person in their corner, right? So, so I really challenge you to think about not only the student's skills, but also the environments that surround our students as you're having these conversations with them. Because there may be a student who normally is a very resilient individual but maybe they're going through something that has really dramatically changed the balance of the protective factors in their lives, and they may not necessarily have that same ability to bounce back. And so we need to sometimes step in and provide a little bit more of that support. So we're on to Flourish by Martin Seligman. Uh, this is a, a, a book that we've read a little bit in our advising community on OSU's campus. Um, Martin Seligman is, his background is psychology and he really is credited at being the founder of positive psychology. Um, so in the 80s, uh, up until that point, psychology was a field of negative experiences, negative emotions, negative diagnoses, um, depression, uh, um, it all, all, all sorts of the what is wrong with people, how do we fix it, how do we provide therapy to make people better. Well, what Martin Seligman recognized is that there are really great things that happen in human beings, and we're not doing a whole lot of research to understand, A, how those things exist, how we cultivate them, and how we reinforce them in order to keep them growing. Um, so a few of the key things that I wanna share from his work, and I do wanna emphasize, this is a book, this is a great one to read either with um, a partner or in a reading group. It is probably one of the more academic books uh, that we have on our, our list, and, and it can be a little bit tough to get through. This is one Nova and I would all often go back and forth and say, okay, so this is what I got from this chapter. Is this, you know, is this sort of what you're taking as well? And, you know, so, so it was a good one to process with someone. Um, but the, the big things that I really want to share with you are that Martin Seligman says that flourishing is, it's not about being happy all the time. You know, it's not rainbows and kittens and unicorns prancing about. It's, it's not about this overt presence of positive happiness. What flourish really is, is finding three things in your life. It's finding those positive emotions because 
we as human beings evolutionarily have been trained to focus on negatives and to run from negatives, right? That's how we survived dinosaurs and volcano explosions and all sorts of other things that, that were a threat to our physical life and success. Now, while we don't have these physical dangers in our lives, that evolutionary trait has stayed with human beings and we often focus on what is negative or what is wrong in our lives. And that's, again, goes back to that negative voice that Brene Brown talks about. We have this tendency toward negative emotion. So what you can do is try to recognize when you're sort of leaning into that pity party side and encourage yourself to embrace more of those positive emotions. That's the first thing to do. The second thing is making sure that you are finding things in your life that you're engaged in and that capture your interest. I know we've all been through those points in our lives. I can certainly say I have as well, where you feel like, you know, everything that's going on is sort of meh, right? And when you're in those points of life, it's really hard to feel valued, to feel interested and excited about what's going on. Uh, so find those things that engage an interest. And this is really key with your students. When they come in and they're experiencing these crises of identity, sometimes it may be, well, I was told to be an engineer because I was really good at math and I was really good at science and, you know, my SAT scores are this and my ACT scores are that. Well, do you like it? Do you enjoy it? Is this, is this something that you want to continue to do for the rest of your life? Not just study for the next four or five years, but do. Sometimes it's really important to come back to that question of engagement or interest with our students. And the third thing, meaning and purpose, right? It's, it's really finding something that you feel like when you do it, it impacts you, it impacts your peers, it impacts the world, something where you feel like you have a meaning, um, something that you're giving back. Now, I love this term. Martin Seligman, when you have the presence of these three things, he calls it being in flow, right? So when you're doing something and you're in it and it's deep and you lose track of time, you feel full, you feel present, you feel engaged in what you're doing. Um, and, and that type of experience, the more that you can include that in your life, the more that you will have that reinforcement of that positive emotion. Now, one little quick exercise that I would like to challenge you all to do is to think about what went well. Now, this is an exercise he talks about in his book, and we've assigned it in classrooms, we've assigned it in advising sessions, students, peers, faculty around campus, we've talked with them about this, and, and this has really sort of become something that a lot of people have done. Our students, we assigned it for one week, and they continued doing it through the rest of the term because they enjoyed it so much. At the end of your day, sit down, either with a journal, with a partner, with a friend, with a group of people out at dinner, and share three things that went well in, in your day and why they went well. Now, what this does is this helps us move towards those positive emotions, helps us move towards what we were engaged in, what we were interested in, what we did well, what we found meaning in. And this little exercise that can take five minutes of your time can work wonders in improving your overall positive affect. All right, so Lori Schreiner took this idea of flourish and asked the question of, what does that look like in college students? And she then coined it as thriving. So same idea to build off of Martin Seligman. So what would that look like in a college student population? Um, and what she's done is she's then developed this entire questionnaire, this research body around this idea of thriving in college students. Um, she describes thriving as optimal learning in, excuse me, optimal functioning in academic, interpersonal and intrapersonal domains of the college experience. So it's really raising awareness and just uplifting the fact that it's more than academic performance that leads to student thriving. And we've seen this. We've seen the student who on paper looks fantastic. There's not a red flag in sight and yet they are floundering and all of a sudden they stop out or their demeanor changes, their affect changes, something goes off. And so it's really heightening that importance of that holistic thriving in the lives of our college students. Um, so she developed a questionnaire of 23 questions called the Thriving Quotient that assesses a student's level of thriving. And it's available on her website if you'd like to look into it more. Um, but the things that Carrie and I love is that 
it, it, she does two things that are really powerful. One is that she goes beyond simply asking, what does a thriving student look like? And asks, what does a thriving campus look like? So often the idea is that a particular department or person is in charge of student thriving, whether that be residential life or student life or academic advising or faculty, that, there, that there's little like roles we've divvied up. And what if we flip it and instead say, we as the campus, we as the institution are committed to student thriving. Then what happens when instead of it being that's just your job or your department's role, what if that's everyone's role and that's our baseline for success in serving students well? The other thing she does is she, she grounds all of this in the idea of transitions. Uh, I think we all know this and have experienced that we're never more vulnerable than going through moments of transition. And our students go through never ending moments of transition in their lives. And the important thing is that campuses do usually a fantastic job of anticipating the big transitions, kind of the, the key mile markers or, or, or mile posts along their journey. So new student registration, um, new student orientation, first time going through finals, moving from on campus to off campus, declaring a major, all of these types of big events that are absolutely important and have fantastic programming often associated. Um, but it's these what she calls non-events that are often just as important, if not more. So it's when a student can't find their classroom on the first day and they're absolutely embarrassed to then go on the second day of class. It's when they earn a C and normally they've been a straight A student. It's when they have a tough interaction with a faculty member and typically have always gotten along famously with instructors. It's a roommate conflict that absolutely shattered their social structure. And so these are things that sometimes we either brush off, not intentionally trying to dismiss it, but just kind of like, oh, well, that happens to everyone. Kind of like what Carrie was saying before. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody gets a C at some point or, oh yeah, roommates. Oh, they're so challenging that first year. But at times, these are the pivotal moment in that student's experience. And so if we, if we can pay particular attention to these moments of thriving and help student, or transition, excuse me, and help students see that they do have some sense of agency, some control over how these experiences occur and the outcome, that's extremely powerful. Um, she has some wonderful, really practical ideas of what this looks like for the advising community. So this is certainly a book that I would recommend for advisors to read together, as there's some really wonderful concrete information that can be gleaned from it. All right, we're going to jump now into Carol Dweck's research on mindset. Um, her research is one that Carrie and I have really latched onto for a number of reasons. Um, her research is also very foundational. So you'll see that a lot of these other researchers that we're talking about are gonna reference her research in one way or another. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it is kind of the, the building block for these other areas that we're discussing with you today. This is one that we have loved presenting to students in a very over active, intentional manner. So when we're talking about don't just secretly do theory to students, this is a prime example. She's got some powerful stuff and students respond to it really positively. Her research is, is kind of a basic idea, but extremely important. And that is that there's this spectrum of mindset. We've got uh, kind of on one end, this idea of fixed mindset, which is that my abilities, my potential, my intelligence are predetermined. I've got a limited amount of each of those areas of my life. And once I hit that, I can't go any further. So I've always been an okay chess player, but I'm never going to be fantastic. I've been a decent artist, but I'm not going to be exceptional. I can sort of do math, but I'm not going to be a mathematician. It's these limits that we've got that we assume are predetermined. And on the opposite end of the spectrum is this idea of growth mindset, that my abilities, my potential, my intelligence are all unknown given enough motivation and effort. So who knows what I'm capable of if I really, really commit to something? 
And she's very careful to say that it's not a, a one or the other. It's not that a person has entirely a fixed mindset or entirely a growth mindset, that there's a spectrum. So I think we can all relate to situations where we've got fantastic growth mindsets in some areas and very fixed in others. And that's a normal thing. Um, she also wants to caution uh, higher education professionals in particular that this isn't just about effort. It's not just this idea of I put in lots and lots and lots and lots of effort and therefore I've got a growth mindset. And the example that she uses is a student who's attempting a math problem and attempts it incorrectly a hundred times. Well, on time 101, person's probably not going to be particularly confident, uh, feeling good about themselves. They might be frustrated, but gosh darn it, they got the effort and they stuck with it. So it's instead being very honest with our students and with ourselves of something's not going well. Instead of using that as a, an indicator of a dead end or a roadblock. It's, all right, what do I do next that's different from what I did before to have a better outcome? And that's where there's resiliency development at play. Um, as one of my students broke it down really simply as who I am today is not necessarily who I'm capable of being tomorrow. And that's the crux of it. And that's straight from a student's mouth. So this is one that we've just loved teaching to students. It's very powerful also because it loops in a little bit of some basic neuroscience, some basic, basic brain science. Um, so quite often we might suggest to a student, uh, they need to kind of ramp up their study skills. Now for high achieving students, this idea of I need to improve my study skills is often perceived as a pretty, um, deficient remedial request. You know, me, I'm good, I don't need that. That's for those other people. Instead, if we frame it as, all right, let's talk a little bit about brain science. Now, what we need to do is make sure your neural pathways are really, really nice and strong. The more we engage in repetition of these new concepts, the stronger those neural pathways are, the easier it is to retrieve that information for an exam. And all of a sudden they're hearing it as, gosh, that's really empowering. I can control that. That's not you telling me I'm deficient in something. That's you giving me some advice and next steps to improve upon a challenge. So this is one, again, we would really, really encourage you to, to um, present to your students and keep them in the loop about this. Um, and Carrie will talk a little bit more in a bit about how simple this type of research can do in terms of an intervention. So very, very limited in terms of time, but a huge impact. All right, the last researcher we're gonna chat about and then we're gonna shift, shift into some application areas is Angela Duckworth. Um, and she's developed this idea of grit or grittiness. Um, and it's a 12 question questionnaire that is a scale of how gritty, to use her, her terminology, a person is. Now she defines grit as passion coupled with the tenacity to overcome obstacles or challenges. So passion coupled with the tenacity to overcome obstacles or challenges. The, the key thing that she brings up that we want to mention is that this is a character trait that can be developed over time, but only if a student sees the relationship between practice and failure, not only the end result of a fruitful venture. So often we as advisors, as parents, as partners, as friends, want to shelter people from those bad moments, those scary moments, those failures. In reality, if we can help students see that through failure, resiliency is developed and there can be successful outcomes, they will become over time more gritty, to use Angela Duckworth's terminology. And, and, and persevere greater in the face of future challenges and obstacles. So we want to, instead of shying away from it and kind of dismissing it as like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And oh, you probably tried your hardest. Let's be honest with ourselves, really sit in that moment and then create an action plan moving forward. All right. 
On the note of moving forward, we're going to talk about some application pieces. Now, these are things that can be short, really quick interventions. They're things that can be assigned to students to do after advising appointments or in the classroom. So there's a plethora of options. And again, if any of you are teaching classes, Nova and I have taught a wide range of classes where we've covered this sort of material. And we have a lot of curriculum and lesson plans available. So please do email us if you would like access to that. So the first one, TED Talks. If you all haven't used these in your advising or your communication plans, your parent communication plans, in teaching to replace readings, do it. It's, it's really a life-changing technology that we have available to us. Um, TED Talks, for the most part, especially if you're working with students, I advise you to keep them 10 to 12 minutes, no, not really much longer than that. Um, really find those engaging and pivotal ones. There's also a whole channel of TED Talks under TED Education. Um, so if you want to look for something specifically about the value of education, different um, resources around study skills, all sorts of things like that. Now the reason that these are so helpful is that students are in the viewing generation, right? They want to view things, whether it's YouTube videos, Facebook, they want to interact with what they're doing. Typical written texts aren't as um, engaging for students a lot of the time. I'm not saying not to assign reading to students, but we do find that students engage really deeply to, to a level that we don't necessarily see with our readings um, when we assign when we assign TED Talks. Now, one of the reasons for that is that TED Talks are often experts, right? That's the first thing. It's not my mom, it's not my teacher, it's not my advisor, it's an expert in this area who's talking. They're usually engaging, um, they're sharing real stories, they're pretty efficient, they're short uh, talks that you can really digest. So there's some really great things here. Um, one TED Talk that Nova and I used to show during our presentation was by Eduardo Briseño, and it was on the power of belief. Now he, it's a really great TED Talk because it brings in a lot of information and data um, where you can see the application of mindset, neuroscience, um, you know, some of the information around uh, positive mindset and resiliency, and, and really does a great job of framing it in story, data, and action, right? So it's something where you can see, you can get a concept, and you can have ideas of how to move forward. Now, one of the best things that he says during this video is that the intervention around a fixed mindset is something that can be so simple, right? So when a student comes into your office and they say, I can't do it, all you have to say is, yet, right? What do we need to do to get you from that point of, I don't believe that I can, to, okay, let's take a small step in this direction and try to move forward. Um, this is also something that Nova um, emailed out to her first year parents, and parents really found um, using TED Talks about what their student experiences were and understanding what their educational experience was, was very helpful. So I highly encourage you to use these um, in various formats in your advising experience. All right. Before we jump into some of these other areas of um, resource, I just want to touch base with Melissa and see if there's any questions out there or anything that has come up related to the research that we've presented thus far. Sure, we do have one question about um, suggestions for supporting students who are actively using a growth mindset um, but are still perceiving failure with their academics. So they're doing really well in school, but they still perceive that they're not doing well. Mm -hmm. So one, one of the things that I would really say is sort of lining up some evidence in front of the student, right? So if the student really is seeing that their effort is paying off, and I can see that based on what I'm seeing on their transcript, based on what I'm hearing from their faculty members, I might say, okay, so let's forget that this is your experience here, right? And let's just look at these pieces of information. Now, would you say that this is a student who is struggling or doing well, right? Because students are really good when they remove themselves from the equation at evaluating what's going on, right? And then once you remove the student's personal onus on it and then have them say, okay, well, you know, I'm seeing some positive grades, I'm seeing some improvement in performance, your faculty members are giving really positive enforcement. Now, if this were anybody but you, it sounds like you would say they're doing well. So why is it that you're giving yourself a harder evaluation than you would give to anyone else? That's the question that I would ask. And then really you have to sort of go where that conversation would go to see how you would unpack that further. Mm -hmm. Great. All right.
Alrighty. So we'll do a little bit more in terms of some resources and application, and then um, we'll do some closing comments. So we're getting toward the tail end, everybody. So um, some of these things we know advisors do really, really well already. So um, this idea of the five questions to ask yourself after a failure, this is a nice little life hack that we've borrowed. And we know that advisors are usually fantastic about asking open-ended questions and engaging in motivational interviewing. So this is by no means new information, just something we want to uplift. Um, quite often, students, when they encounter failure, and this would be probably anybody when they encounter a moment of failure, would much rather prefer to ignore it, pretend it didn't happen, avoid the reality of it. Uh, and what they often need is somebody to help facilitate that experience and guide them through. And that's where advisors can be particularly impactful. So instead of just ignoring, putting it, sweeping it under the bed, let's actually spend some time with this experience. What can I learn from this? So let's take some agency and some ownership of the experience. What, if anything, could I have done differently? We certainly recognize there are times where a situation occurs and it's absolutely beyond a student's control. Huge life crisis, family emergency, et cetera. Um, but where there are things that I myself could have done differently, what are they? Where do I have some responsibility in the outcome? Do I need to acquire or improve some different skills? That again goes back to the idea of some neuroscience and growth mindset. How do I simply build upon what I already know to improve upon my outcome next time? Who are my mentors? Who can I go to, my support system? That idea of care and support that Nan Henderson discusses. And then what's my action item? What's my next step? To give a really concrete, actionable um, uh, stage that a person's going to go into after doing the self-reflection. So again, we know this is work that advisors do really well already, just wanting to uplift it as an important thing to keep at the forefront of this process of developing resiliency. All right. So um, one of the best things to do to move out of failure is to figure out what goals you can make a part of your life to move forward. Now, I don't know if any of you have had this similar experience. I know Nova and I usually when we say the G word, students eyes roll into the back of their head, they start drooling and they fall over backwards because they're like, not another goal. I can't handle it. This is terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so we have decided and started using um, a wellness wheel. Now, this is something we first used in a classroom setting, but now have since used many, many times in the advising context. Now, the nice thing about this is it's a quick way for a student to think about their holistic well-being, so not just related to their academic performance, because sometimes when you're in I failed, I suck, life is terrible valley, it's really hard to think about how to build yourself moving forward in that particular area where you're feeling so much pain. But if you look at your overall holistic wellness, you might be able to identify another area where you still could use some positive improvement, you still could make some positive changes, but might not necessarily be directly related to your academics. So what we have students do, rate yourself on a 1 through 10 in each of these areas. Now let's pick one area that we're going to talk about. Okay, so let's say you're going to pick your physical health, right? Now you rated yourself a three. What can you do by our next advising appointment, by our next class meeting, by the end of the term, to get yourself from a three to a five in your physical wellness, right? So we're not talking about going from Vale Valley to, you know, ruling the world peak. We're talking about what can we do to make some small positive changes. Now, the reason this type of exercise is so important is because you can help students build some positive change, get some small successes in their lives, and then that builds momentum to creating more of these large scale changes. So Carrie and I want to be really, I think, upfront and honest with the folks that this is tough work, not just for students, but for advisors. Um, I know for myself personally, there are countless times where I have essentially phoned it in in my advising work, um, where I did everything correctly. A student comes in, presents their concerns, questions, I address them, I practiced active listening, I provided them the appropriate resources, referrals, next steps, scheduled a follow-up appointment, all the things. And yet when the student left my office, I knew that I probably could have been more present. And sometimes it's just because I was exhausted. It was the 21st student I'd seen that day during peak advising registration. And I just didn't have the emotional capacity to be entirely present with that student. Um, but other times it's because doing so would have been really vulnerable on my part. 
because perhaps some of what a student is presenting are things I've encountered. Maybe they're things that are bringing up challenges from my own past as a student or my present reality. And that's asking a lot. So we want to be really clear that there are times where it is appropriate for advisors to self-disclose um, within particular parameters and to say things like, you know, I get it. I've been there. Because so many times when a student is in crisis mode, when they're encountering failure, there is no quick fix. There is no list of referrals, resource guide. There's nothing I can do to guarantee that the problem that they're presenting will be solved when they leave my office. But what I can do is offer care and support to be genuinely present and to practice empathy. Now, Brene Brown has a nice little video that we're gonna watch in just a moment. It's her voiceover talking about the difference between empathy and sympathy. And again, these are things advisors know but it's so often tempting to fall into the sympathy realm when really what students need is an empathic response. What Carrie and I have learned is that empathy is ultimately essential to resiliency develop in our students. <sighs> So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you, know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. All right, let me get this slideshow going again. Okay, so thank you all for tuning in for that video. Um, we don't obviously have the most ideal format to have a really deep reflective conversation as it is a webinar. So I would challenge you, especially if you have some advising colleagues that you've watched this webinar with, to think about how you feel in this moment. What are the things that are standing out to you emotion-wise, experience-wise, um, technique-wise that you really want to keep um, and take into your advising practice because oftentimes we have these moments where we hear something 
and then we go on and we have lunch and we talk and we run into someone else and we forget how we felt in that moment. So, so take some time um, once we finish with the question and answer portion of the presentation to come back and, and sit with some of these reflection questions. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it over to Melissa and to you all as an audience. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them our way. All right, great. First of all, I want to give a huge thanks to Nova and Carrie. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, lots of fantastic resources that I think all of our audience members um, are going to really utilize in their work. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to open it up to questions. So you can use the Q&A feature uh, on the Zoom platform. Um, see if you have any questions for our panelists. And we'll hold tight to see if any of those come across. None yet. <laughs> we answered all of the questions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> pretty, efficient. <laughs> pretty comprehensive of her view, I think. It's, it's really great. And I will say this topic is near and dear to my heart. I do teach a, a leadership course for students in our honors program that's mm -hmm. um, based on Brene Brown's work. So mm -hmm. they are doing, um, in fact, their whole project is to do something that scares them. And mm -hmm. they, I yeah. love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and as Carrie mentioned at the start, we're happy to entertain questions via email. Mm -hmm. So this is by no means the only opportunity to, right. to connect with us. Right. And we do have a Facebook group for the Commission for Advising High Achieving Students. So um, I did just tweet the link out to that, but just look on Facebook for Advising High Achieving Students. Um, and you can always join that group and continue the conversation there if you're on Facebook. Um, we do have a couple of questions now that have popped up. Um, one is, how do we uh, integrate Brene Brown's work into vulnerab vulnerability? Mm. Hmm. So, um, I, I guess, is that asking how, so Brene Brown talks about how to be vulnerable. Um, so basically, if, if you're trying to be more vulnerable, either just in your life with your relationships that you count near and dear, or if it's with your students, um, Brene Brown has some really great tips on, on again, being honest with yourself um, reality checking negativity, finding, I think the most important piece of advice around vulnerability is finding somebody who you authentically connect with because we've all been in those relationships where you're like, oh my gosh, I had a terrible day. And then the person that you're talking to is like, oh, me too. Let me tell you, you know, and you're like, I, 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 I okay. <laughs> Never mind. I'll hold my terrible day to myself. You know, and, and um, you want to have more relationships in your life that say, oh, tell me what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think listening is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, do you think there are particular strategies that might work best for underrepresented students? Um, so this is something where we don't mention it specifically. Um, both Carrie and I have worked with underrepresented students in various capacities. Um, a lot of my work was actually with students who entered academically underprepared for particular um, academic disciplines. So maybe they're fantastic kind of overall, but they're really just not prepared for a particular area of study. Um, and then also those who enter as first generation, low socioeconomic status, um, student of color in particular population, um, academic areas that are typically underrepresented historically. A um, couple things would be uh, there's huge amounts of research around the impact and value of mentorship programs, of building small communities of folks who are um, have a similar background. And so there's likely some, some work already being done on most campuses around that. Um, we're certainly happy to talk more about what that research shows, um, if that would be of interest. Um, the other thing is the area of, of um, talking about the challenges that students are experiencing. So often it's this idea of, it's just me, I'm the only one. When we know they're not the only one, but it can feel that way of, I'm the only one who comes from this background. I'm the only one who's having trouble in this area. I'm the only one who, and if we can help students see that they're not, whether that's through intentional community building, through um, linked courses, 
uh, through um, group advising. There's all kinds of different models and ways to approach it, um, but it's, it's helping them move beyond I'm the only one and seeing that there is a community of support. So a lot of what Nan Henderson talks about with care and support, um, mm -hmm. and then also interweaving some of that growth mindset as well. Great. Another question is, do you have suggestions for students who have difficulty moving on and knowing when to move on? For example, the pre-med student who may no longer be pre-med. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so this is something I work with students all the time, um, especially the degree program I work in now is very geared towards high achievers. And, you know, sometimes high achievers sort of take on a lot of realities, a lot of possibilities, a lot of potentials. And then as the funnel starts getting tighter, how much time I have and how much ability I have to take on all of these things I've taken on, it comes to that question of, Okay, let's let's have a reality check moment, right? So you want outcome A, whether it's med school, graduating with four degrees, you know, what whatever that challenge is. Now, what amount of effort would it take to get from where you're at to this outcome? Or is it even possible? If it's possible, how much effort would it take? Now, are you willing to expend that effort? Now, several times I've had that exact conversation with students, and in the meeting they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, okay, okay you know, I, I think I can do it. And then after they have time to sort of sit with it and reflect on it a little bit, when they've had that reality check of, of okay, I have a 3.2 GPA, I need to get a 3.8 GPA, and I only have 40 credits left to take till I graduate. You know, am I willing to retake and, you know, quit my job and, you know, do all the things that it's going to take to divide enough time into, into getting that GPA? And, and sometimes really trying out that reality is very helpful for students in knowing when they just aren't, don't, don't have the ability or don't have the desire to follow through with that plan. Okay, it looks like we have answered all of the questions. So I want to thank everyone once again. Um, thank you to our participants for uh, watching the webinar today. Thank you really to Carrie and Nova for this amazing presentation. Thanks to our behind the scenes folks, uh, Lee Cunningham, Gary Cunningham, and Elisa Schaefer. Um, who were instrumental in making sure all of this went smoothly. Um, and as I said before, uh, feel free to continue the conversation in our Facebook group for the Advising High Achieving Students Commission. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you.